Good morning. Christ is risen. Welcome. I want to invite you to take a look at the back of your bulletin. You'll see upcoming ways for us to grow in faith and to serve our Lord together. So please mark your calendars. We thank God for the privilege of being together to celebrate Easter this morning. At the end of our worship service, we'll be singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And if you'd like to join in the singing, we invite you to come forward. You'll see music up here, and there will be places with the choir. And so come and sing for the joy of this day. And now please join in our opening sentences. The Lord is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. This is the good news by which we are saved. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Let us raise our alleluias and worship the Lord. Confident of God's undying love, we pray together, seeking God's help and hope and healing. <clears throat> Let us pray. O oh God of all hope and joy, we confess that we continue to live in fear. You raised Jesus to new life, yet we hold on to former things. You offer salvation to all, Yet we fail to share this good news. 
Forgive us, O God of grace. By your Spirit, make us witnesses to the wonder of the empty tomb and the fullness of life you promise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. in a position to condemn. Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ is risen for us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. You can stay standing. Again, welcome to worship. Um, this is a place where we celebrate new life and resurrection every Sunday all through the year. After we pass the peace, I would remind you, please sign in on the friendship pads, especially if we don't have contact information. We would love to be able to, to greet you um, in the way that you choose. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And do share signs of Christ's peace with one another.
I would like to invite the children to come up to the front steps for the children's time. You guys sound good. <laughs> we invite our pastors to come out too because we think it's important that you guys get to see their faces also because most of the time you leave during their sermon time. So we're going to be over here by this box if you guys want to come over this way a little bit. Our box has been tied up for six weeks. Does anybody remember what we put in the box? Do you want to guess what's in the box? Oh, Stella, do you remember what's in the box? <gasps> Say it again. Say it loud. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. We put that word in the box. Well, today we're letting it out. We're going to untie this box. I counted that we already said hallelujah 36 times. So far this morning, now we've said it 38, maybe 39. Every time I count, I came up with a different number. Sure. We're going to look inside. What do you think is in this box? There's nothing in there. April Fool's. Look what's in this box. It says, Alleluia. We say the special word, Alleluia, on Easter because we, we know that Christ is risen today. And we say, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Can you say that? Alleluia, Christ is risen. All right, there's a couple more things in here. Ooh, a lamb. We hold that, Jenna? We're going to talk about this stuff when we go into the chapel. A butterfly. Skyla, you want to hold that? All right. An Easter egg? It's empty. We'll talk about that, too. And a lily. All things that remind us of Jesus and remind us of Easter. And we're going to talk about that in the chapel. Let's say a prayer together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you've given us, the many blessings. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who has risen today. And all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, roll away the stone and reveal to us the word of life. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. And to put this in context, an angel from God had appeared in a vision to Cornelius, a centurion and told him to summon Peter and his companions to his household. Peter's sermon to the household of Cornelius represents the first time the good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection was shared with the Gentiles and shows us that Christ died for all of humanity. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day 
and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Our second reading is the account of the resurrection according to the Gospel of John. Let us listen for the Word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, 
Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the tomb, the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of our Lord. <clears throat> happy Easter. And happy April Fool's Day. <laughs> Has anyone befallen a prank yet today? Oh, some people in the back. Okay. My sympathies. <clears throat> It's a rare combination to have these two days be on the same day, and you might think it's an odd combination. Easter, our most sacred day of the Christian calendar, a joyous day built on the foundation of the cross and execution, not exactly a laughing matter. And then there's April Fool's Day, the most silly day of the secular calendar, a raucous day built on the foundation of tomfoolery, entirely a laughing matter. It's rare that these two days fall together, it is true, but the more I think about it, it isn't necessarily an odd combination. In fact, it may be perfect. April Fool's Day exalts the one who gets the last laugh. Lady Gaga is the latest one to record that old Gershwin song made famous by Fred Astaire. Do you remember it? It's about a couple that compares the unlikely, the unexpected success of their relationship with other unlikely, unexpected successes in history. They all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. They all laughed when Edison recorded sound. They all laughed at Wilbur and his brother when they said that man could fly. And finally, they all said we never could be happy. They laughed at us and how. But ho, 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 who's got the last laugh now? April Fool's Day. <laughs> what better way to describe Easter than the most divine last laugh. Lexicographers say a laugh, last laugh means 
a situation where it's a satisfaction of ultimate success or triumph, especially after being scorned or regarded as a failure. Wow. On Easter, we celebrate the satisfaction of God's ultimate triumph in Christ. After Christ was scorned, literally scorned to death on a cross, and regarded by all, even his disciples in that last week, as a failure. Hmm. So perhaps April Fool's Day is just right for Easter. After all, Jesus was a fool. You know that, right? Even the Bible says so. Paul, in teaching that first church in Corinth, said, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. That's a profound and paradoxical statement. What sort of foolishness do you suppose Paul means by this? Our whole Lenten season in our congregation has been under the theme, Fools for Love, and we picked up that idea because this year, for the first time in 73 years, not only is Easter on April Fool's Day, but the whole season began Ash Wednesday on February 14th, Valentine's Day. So we were thinking about lovers and romance and the fun foolishness of love, love that goes out for another, which is a great way to describe God's love. We've had fun all season. There's some other ways to think about foolishness, and I'd like to offer a few here. First of all, there's the foolishness that's silly, the pie-in-the-face whoopee cushion kind of foolishness, the April Fool's Day prank kind of foolishness. You perhaps have a memory of a time you pulled off a prank or fell prey to a prank. Remember the year, it wasn't very long ago, that Columbus Dispatch carried a story that due to a lawsuit from some tiny little out-of-the-way college, the university had to give up its colors, scarlet and gray, and instead, according to reporter April Uno, we would now be ruby and porpoise. Some people fell for it. So generally, on April Fool's Day, the foolishness that's silly, generally there's no harm done. On rare occasions, some good can even be done, even beyond the laughter that it provokes. I read that one April 1st, a woman in California so alarmed her boss with her April Fool's message on the community message board, the inner office message board, it's been nice knowing you, but I'm going on to something new now, that he gave her a raise. (laughs) The message was a prank but the raise was real. (laughs) So there's foolishness that's silly, yet there's also foolishness that's sad. This is the foolishness when we ignore time-honored wisdom, the foolishness that leads to regret. I may tell you about a time I fell for an April Fool's prank, but I'm probably going to keep to myself the moments that I know I was foolish without anyone else's prompting. We don't post this kind of foolishness on Facebook, but many of us experience us. It's the kind of foolishness that may bring us closer to tears than to laughter. This kind of foolishness is often about choices, and it goes back as far as Adam and Eve and their choices, foolish choices, and leaves us feeling as they felt exposed and vulnerable. Knowing that Adam and Eve fell for it too is important because it means that foolishness is part of the human condition, part of the sinful nature of our condition, part of Satan's prank on us. For better or for worse, it's a real part of this human life. Part of the spiritual anatomy of this congregation, which I enjoy so much, is a refrain that was often repeated by a former pastor, Phil Hazelton, who was fond of saying, life is messy. That's true. And we are all in this together. We make mistakes. We miss important opportunities with one another. There is an unavoidable, inevitable 
sad foolishness to human life. And because of this, it is so very crucial to know that there is also a foolishness, not just a foolishness that's silly, not just a foolishness that's sad, but a foolishness that saves. Care to the wind kind of foolishness. This is the foolishness that dares beyond caution, beyond good sense, for the sake of another. We see it in many forms. This is saving foolishness for the sake of discovery. They all laughed at Wilbur and his brother. This time last year, I was reading David McCullough's biography of the Wright brothers and learned in it, do you know that the U.S. government laughed at the Wright brothers? They brought them this new flying machine and were ready to sell, sell it, to get a military contract, and the government said, we, there's no military application of that. <laughs> so they sold it to France. They're saving foolishness for the sake of healing. You know probably that they laughed for 300 years about the idea of germ theory of illness until finally Louis Pasteur persuaded them, us. There is the saving foolishness that is for the sake of human dignity, ironic though, though that sounds, foolishness for dignity. This Thursday marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Presbyterian pastor Tom Long tells a story of growing up in, in Atlanta and knowing that there were certain times of year that the KKK would parade their fear and hate right through the heart of black Atlanta. And for years, the people living in those neighborhoods hid in their homes and pulled down their curtains as the march came by. But after the civil rights movement took hold and the nation was beginning to change, what happened about those marches had changed too. And then when the KKK came marching down the street, the people came out of their houses and they stood and watched and they pointed at the men in the white hoods and they laughed. Who's got the laugh, la last laugh now? Saving foolishness. Most of all, the foolishness that saves is the foolishness that is for the sake of love. Because again, Jesus was a fool. He dared to live by God's ways 100% of the time, not just talk about him. He hung around with people who wouldn't help him get ahead. He challenged the powerful and he cared for the weak. How foolish is that? He spoke the truth regardless of his audience. When pressure against him rose, he did not relent. Even his disciples urged him not to be so foolish. He persevered on his mission to prove that love is truly stronger than death. He told foolish stories about a father who forgives his prodigal son who messed up royally, about a Samaritan, an outsider, a foreigner, who risks everything to care for a stranger. And he believes foolish things too. He believes things like that five loaves and two fish could satisfy the hunger of 5,000 and then some. And he believed that one widow's tiny offering, just one coin, was worth more than a rich man's tithe because it represented full devotion and not just a token. And he behaved in foolish ways. He irritated the powerful, touch, touched lepers, he had dinner with undesirables, he healed the sick, he praised the ignored and he drew into his mercy all the foolishness that burdened the hearts around him. Most foolish of all, he had the chance to escape ex execution. All he had to do was deny his message. He wouldn't do it. He put up no defense, no show of force. He allowed himself to be weak, to be killed, a grotesque, painful death. That's the way of the world where death has the last laugh. 
And this is where Valentine's Day, Ash Wednesday, and April Fool's Day, Easter all run together. Brian Edwards, our director of youth ministry, proclaimed on Ash Wednesday that Ash Wednesday should always be Valentine's Day because then maybe everyone remem would remember how crazily, foolishly, completely God loves us beyond all reason and all costs. Because early Sunday morning, the third day, <clears throat> in the quiet of the dawn, near a tomb now empty, if you listen very carefully, you can hear softly coming from heaven, Satan said, you never can be happy. He laughed at you and how, but ho, 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 who's got the last laugh now? God raised Jesus from the dead to prove that God's foolishness in Jesus Christ is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness in Jesus Christ is stronger than human strength. God's foolishness, the foolishness that saves, the foolishness that's greater than human wisdom and therefore great enough to hold us completely, our foolishness and all, in one great embrace of love. And from that embrace, we are free to join in Free ourselves to be fools that save, to be fools for love, to defy the power of death in every generous gesture we make and in every action that imitates the foolishness of Jesus our Savior. Happy April Fool's Day. <coughs> Happy Easter. In Jesus Christ, God has had the last laugh and in Jesus Christ, so can we. Alleluia, amen. Seated, please. He is risen. He is risen Come on, Presbyterians, work with me. He is risen. He is risen Who's the little girl that came down the aisle and shouted hallelujah? She's got it. She knows what's going on. We ought to follow her lead. 
How can you sit there straight faced on such a glorious morning? Your biggest mortal enemy has just had his rear end kicked. God has had the last laugh. I love Easter for all the years. This is the only time of year I can wake up early in the morning and feel good. Most of the time I gripe, but it's Easter, hallelujah. Especially in this stage of my call when I don't have to preach. Julia carries the heavy load. And what a fantastic Easter sermon. Thank you, Julia. I love that. Uh, let's pray, Easter people. Come on. What a marvelous, marvelous, extravagantly loving God you are. And what a morning. What a day. Eternal life is now ours. Not because we earned it, but because of your incredible, foolish, suffering love, you have opened the gates of heaven to all of us who believe. And we gather this morning because we believe. And we thank you for that wonderful gift. And not only for us, but for all of those we have loved who have left this earth, we know and we have confidence that they are fine and they are okay and that we too will join them in the heavenly kingdom. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ who sits at your right hand but also through the power of the Spirit is present with us every day of our lives. How come we don't just burst out laughing suddenly sometime during the day, knowing what a precious gift we have and knowing that we have Christ uh, and his love every day of our life on this earth? But don't let us take that for granted and don't let us keep that to ourselves. This world's in desperate need <coughs> of such a foolish love. Help us be the fools that the gospel calls us to be. Help us to learn to turn the other cheek and not to strike back. Teach us how to pray for our enemies and love our enemies as Christ did. Help us to be more generous, to let go of more and hold tightly to less as Jesus taught us. And help us to open our arms to embrace more people, even those we might not even like. And help us, Lord, to be witnesses for peace. Help us to learn how to play second fiddle in a world where number one and get whoever is in your way out of the way seems to be the theme. Use us as foolish disciples. And Lord, there are many on our hearts in need of healing, in need of joy, in need of peace, guidance, and wisdom. And we raise them up into your loving arms and loving heart. Heal where they need healed. Give peace where they need peace. Give guidance where they need guidance. And Lord, remember, remind us that this story is not done. Indeed, Christ has risen and we will rise with him, but the final of the gospel will be when Christ returns. And in the meantime, there will be those who think that they are getting the the last laugh on us. Forces of evil, forces of greed, lust for power. So we pray for those who stand between us and evil. We pray for our men and women in the military and may the joy of Easter touch them this morning wherever, wherever they may be. For our law enforcement officers, our fire, our emergency personnel and all first responders. Bless them also and we thank you on this glorious day. Now Lord, until that day when the whole creation shouts hallelujah, when Christ comes back to establish the kingdom he witnessed to in his life. Until that day, we will continue to pray the glorious prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> every pastor knows, excuse me, <coughs> every pastor knows that on Easter we get visitors 
who may not be a part of a church throughout the rest of the year, but come to celebrate Easter Sunday. If that is you today, here's your invitation. If you want to find more meaning in your life, if you want to be fed, fed spiritually, if you want to make a difference in the world, come join us at Worthington Presbyterian uh, as we celebrate this Easter morning every Sunday in the year to come. All right, how many people uh, have died for you? What will you give in return for your life? Let's receive the offering. your mind, that would be a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen.
Go into the world in peace. Go into the world with courage. The tomb is empty so that our hearts might be full, full of crazy, foolish, saving love. And now may the grace of our risen Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.